The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, Where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hands? Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Jose, and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his native place, and among his own kin and in his own house. So he was not able to perform any mighty deed there, apart from curing a few sick people by laying his hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. All three readings today have something in common. Whether it's Ezekiel, St. Paul, or our Lord Jesus Christ, all of them found themselves in situations where they should have been able to experience great joy in their ministry. But at this, that moment, when they should have been able to experience that great joy, they experienced rather great humility through their exercising of that ministry. And I think that can be true of all of us. In the moment, sometimes, of our greatest achievements, in the moments when we feel like we are actually accomplishing something, that is sometimes the moment when we can experience the greatest humility in our lives because in those moments we are being humbled at the very same time. I remember back when I was in seminary and we were getting ready to take all of our final exams. And in seminary you have to take what they call comprehensives, which are oral and written exams, and you're being tested on everything you learned over the four years of theology and how well you can synthesize all of that together so that when I get up here to do a homily, it actually makes sense to all of you and that I'm actually helping everyone to understand what is the teachings of our faith itself. So when you're preparing for all of that, that means you have to study everything over those four years, over a period of one month, prior to when you're going to take your comprehensives. And the way that they would do that, they would, uh, they would post a listing of who the faculty members that you were given who were going to test you. And so when that day came, I was kind of late getting to the bulletin board, but most of my classmates were already there ahead of me. And as I'm walking down the hall, all of a sudden I hear a couple of my friends say, oh, Anthony, where do you see the team that you got? And as I got closer, and they were saying, thank God I don't have that team. And you know, and I'm, I'm starting to worry inside, oh my God, who did I get? And I'm trying not to show my concern as I get to the bulletin board. And when I see the two uh, professors that I, that I was assigned, I, I did kind of gulp inside, and I kind of said to myself, don't let them see you sweat. And so I said, oh, this will be fine. I had both of these professors in other courses, did okay with them. So I wasn't really that worried at that moment. But of course, I had a whole month to start worrying about it. And during the month, we would get together as uh, study groups. And so each of us would take a certain area of, of, of theological study and we present it to the study group. And that's how we kind of put everything together over those four years and into that one month of studying for it. So when the time came, the first day for me in my comprehensives were to do my written examinations. And again, you didn't know exactly what questions you were going to get. You, it was a blind pull. And you had to pull out of, a, out of a container and there were the questions and then you had to write the essays on it. And I was fine with that, the, the, the written examinations went well, I was comfortable with that. And then the next day was going to be the oral examinations in front of those two professors. And I remember what my, my um, spiritual director and my advisor had said, the night before your oral exam, stop studying. The, enough is enough. So I didn't study the night before, but as the evening went on, I got more and more anxious. And by the time the morning came, and I was going down for those oral examinations. I had myself, what I would say, a bit stressed out. So when I get into the room, 
and the two professors start asking me questions. And I kind of, well, I drew a blank. I, that's the best way to put it. And I couldn't answer it. I mean, what I was answering was not making much sense. I mean, they could have asked me who Jesus Christ was, and I don't think I was going to be able to actually give them a good explanation of who he was. And so, as the oral examination is going on and on, I'm spiraling downward more and more in this examination. They, they stop it, and they say, you know, I think we need to just stop this and call it a day. And I said, okay. And they said, we have to give you a grade. And they said, we have to give you a D. I said, a D? And, you know, and I was, so I left the room devastated. I knew that I could go back and eventually retake the oral exams, but that didn't help me in any way or form. So I went to my advisor, who was also the vice rector of the seminary, and I, I needed to talk to him. I needed his advice, I needed his guidance, but he was in a meeting and I had to wait. And, and I, in waiting, I was getting more and more upset at, over what had happened. And so finally, when I get in there with him, I just totally pulled apart. I, you know, 30 years old and I'm like a big baby. And I'm just, you know, so upset by this whole experience. And I, you know, I told him, you know, what had happened. And his response to me was, I'm glad that happened to you. Which then stung me even more than what had just happened in the oral examination. And he said, let me tell you why I'm happy that happened to you. He says, what you learned in that moment, in that experience, and what those two examiners did, you will never do to somebody else. That you, in being humbled the way that you were humbled, and needing help in the moment that you needed the most help, and you did not receive that help. He said, because what they should have done was just give you a break, let you leave the room, and compose yourself so that you could come back in. He says, but now that this has happened to you, you will remember what this was like and you will never allow yourself to do that to anybody else. And it was a good lesson to learn. It was an important lesson to learn, especially if you're going to be a priest, it's an important lesson to learn. In the very same way, that was the experience that Ezekiel had. Ezekiel was all excited. You know, he was excited, he was called to be a prophet. You know, being called to be a prophet by God was, was a, an experience unlike anything else. You know, you're exalted amongst the people. But Ezekiel was being sent to the people of Israel who were in exile in Babylon. And these are people who were, as we hear in that first reading, were obstinate and hard-hearted toward God because they had turned away from the one true God of Israel and they had embraced false gods, which led them to their own downward spiral of ultimately being torn from the land itself. And when they were torn from the land, they didn't know if God was with them anymore. Because the concept of God at that time was God was a territorial God. So the God of Israel was just for Israel and just for them. They didn't have the concept that this was the one universal God for everybody. Not until they're in Babylon, in exile. And it's in Babylon that they realize God is with them. Because they are receiving prophetic word from Ezekiel and the other prophets that are in exile. But they still were not open to what Ezekiel was calling them to do because Ezekiel was calling them to repent and to reconcile themselves with God. And so just as the people of Israel were humbled, so was Ezekiel because he's being rejected for the message that he's bringing. Right at the time, he should have felt the greatest exaltation. In the very same way, we hear in the second reading about St. Paul and how St. Paul was achieving great things in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul had gone on three different missionary journeys during his time. And each of those missionary journeys took him into what is modern day Turkey and to Greece and ultimately to Italy. And on those missionary journeys, that's when he founded the churches of Ephesus and Corinth and Galatea and all of those places. And in establishing those communities, he was able to sow the seeds of faith itself. But in his moment of greatest exaltation, he also was being humbled as well. He speaks about, in that letter today, about the thorn in his side. He never tells us what the thorn 
in his side is. Only that he asked the Lord to take the thorn away. So we know it's some type of difficulty, some type of suffering, some type of, of, of him being tempted, whatever it might be. But the Lord's response to him was kind of like my own uh, advisor's response to me. When Paul prays and the Lord says, know that his grace is sufficient in him. And his grace will sustain Paul. And ultimately, Paul comes to understand that in making himself weak, Jesus Christ becomes stronger in us because we recognize the need for Christ. And there's the humility itself, that we're humble enough to admit our need for Jesus Christ in our daily lives. And no greater example is given to us than Christ himself. In the gospel, when the Lord goes to his hometown of Nazareth, after he himself has been in the desert, he's been tempted, overcomes those temptations of Satan, is baptized at the Jordan, calls forth the first apostles, he goes to his hometown, and he goes to the synagogue, but he's rejected by those who know him best, his family members, his friends, the other residents of Nazareth himself. They could not get beyond that this was the Jesus they knew growing up. The carpenter's son, all those years. And because they couldn't get over that, they couldn't open their hearts to the grace and the healing that Christ was bringing to them. And so Jesus himself, in a moment of great exaltation, at least it should have been, is humbled. Humbled for our sake. And I think it's important for us to realize, and this is God. This is God humbling himself for you and for me, so that we can be forgiven our sins and given everlasting life. This is the God who goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he gets on his knees, and God surrenders God to God's self. And he says, Father, not, let it not be my will, but your will be done. This is the same God who then is humiliated when he is arrested in the Garden. And when he is put on trial that night, and then ultimately when he is scourged and the crown of thorns are placed on his head, and then ultimately when he has to bear that cross, and he was humbled when he fell not the first time, not the second time, not the third time, but the entire experience. He was humbled throughout that journey to Calvary itself. And then ultimately, when he is nailed to the cross and he suffers and dies for our sake, Jesus Christ makes himself weak on the cross so that we ourselves can be strong in our faith. Because as he said to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient. And that grace is poured out for us on the cross itself. And so we ourselves are asked, are we willing to be humbled? Are we willing to, be, to make ourselves weak so Jesus can be strong in our lives?